I'm really excited here uh, to welcome uh, Professor Van Mehu. Uh, so I, I think nobody needs an introduction for this guy. Almost everybody have uh, uh, read his book or heard about him on some or other way. But I have a privilege knowing him for various reasons. Uh, he's my academic father. Uh, I did my PhD with him. Uh, he's my current manager too, so I have to be careful on what I say. <laughs> Uh, but more importantly, I think he's a very fun person to uh, work with. Uh, we call him, in short, Humble Venme. Uh, so we'll go through uh, uh, some of his career uh, things that he has done. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, four decades, three decades of transitions. Uh, we'll cover some of them. Please. To give a brief history about the kinds of work that he has done, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, for those who do not know, apart, most of the people know about his work on the PMPP textbook, uh, but uh, most of your computers that are working today uh, do uh, out of order execution. Uh, and yeah, it's his PhD thesis uh, that actually perfected out of order execution. So if he had not written that HPS paper and not went to Intel to perfect the out of order execution, none of your computers would be working today. And this was his first decade. Uh, then in the second decade, uh, he decided to move towards compilers. Uh, then he uh, introduced uh, hyperblock, uh, superblock concepts to compilers that are there in almost every compiler that are being used, uh, almost every place. Third decade was about CUDA. Uh, and now he is into his fourth decade, uh, looking into something even amazing. We'll talk about that. So when may, I think the uh, biggest question uh, that I always wanted to ask for like seven years uh, now how did you pick those ideas to work on? Uh, like every single decade you picked a problem that's fantastic, uh, and that problem was, did not even exist at that time. Uh, and you worked on the uh, problem, you figured it out, and you started solving it. But how did you get those ideas in? Okay, um, luck. <laughs> um, so, Four times. <laughs> um, couple things. Uh, when I was a grad student, I, I listened to the, you know, the, the great graduate student talk uh, at the beginning of the session. And I was at UC Berkeley in 1983. And that was a very, very interesting time, almost identical to what we're experiencing today, but in the hardware. Okay, so um, the, you know, the in chip integration is getting to the point where we can start to build, we're talking about incorporating all, enough transistors and a, whole processor, right, a whole processor on the chip. And that was the time where people start to debate on various things. Um, for those of you who know the history, um, the risk project from Berkeley was extremely influential. They asked a very important question. How do I squeeze enough transistors into the chip to build the simplest possible processor so that I can have the first successful commercial product. A lot of grad students contributed to it. Dave Patterson and Randy Katz and, you know, the, and uh, uh, Alan Smith and various people contributed to that. And the industry took off from that point. I asked a little bit different question. I said, if, if Moore's Law is really right, in five years, in six years, we're not going to be talking about squeezing things into a chip. We're going to be talking about how to make these chips real, right? And so we started to look at the history of mainframe and think about why some of these things failed. And then everything pointed to exception handling and interrupt handling. IBM tried again and again failed. So. I said, okay, that sounds like an interesting question. So, the, you know, the, if, you know, if we can make it to work, 10 years from now, people can build a real processor with enough transistors to do this. And, his, you know, it's just luck. And we, you know, we, we had enough, you know, people at Intel who, who got really interested in this, and Bob Cowell who was building P6, and then, you know, he, he hired one of my students from Illinois and some of Yale students, and you know, they figure out some of the things we actually didn't figure out, okay? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> and that's, that's 
history, right? So th this collaboration thing is incredibly important. We cannot figure out everything ourselves, right? And some things we just can't figure out as a person, but as a team, as a, as a community, someone will figure it out. And everyone said that this cannot be done. By the way, when I give a, a talk, Mark Horowitz came to me afterwards and said, nobody will ever build that processor, okay? And that was the year when I was interviewing for a job, okay? <laughs> so it was, you know, it was very, very, very discouraging. On the other hand, if you get enough good people interested in that same problem, and sooner or later someone will figure it out, at that point, you can take some credit, okay? <laughs> Humble one, man, uh, as always. Uh, so uh, I think the key message that you're trying to tell is uh, work on the hardest problem. Uh, don't worry uh, what the outcome is. Try to solve the most hardest problem uh, and work with the community, build a community, uh, and grow with the community. Well, thanks, thank you. That's a very nice, interesting insight. I think uh, we pulled some questions together um, uh, before the start of this event. And the most important questions everybody asked is like, when is your next edition of book coming? And what is it, what is it going to contain? Okay. Um, every book, every edition ruined one of the Thanksgivings. <laughs> so this one is probably going to do the same thing. So we are targeting end of the year. So that's why every edition ruins one of the Thanksgivings for all of us. But uh, <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, what does the new book is going to cover? What are, you, uh, uh, what are you hoping to cover in this new book? Yeah, uh, GPU computing advanced tremendously, right? Now, there are several things that we obviously did not cover in the uh, first four editions. The multi-GPU aspect is you know, blatantly missing, and uh, you know, now it's, it's so mature and so important for every... Uh, use you know uh, every data center now, right? So the you know the the multi GPU NVLink kind of uh, paradigm or multi GPU you know the uh, data center you know, uh, paradigm, and there are all these you know the, uh, important problems in terms of the uh, how you actually pull together GPUs for you know let's say distributed matrix multiplication and so on, and um, it, it has been really uh, undercovered in terms of, you know, just the intellectual, you know, what's underneath this, you know, what, the, why, what motivates the NVLink 72? And a lot of people don't realize some of the underlying forces, so we're trying to explain these things so that people can understand. And there are many other, you know, types of algorithms that uh, we did not feel that GPUs were good for, but uh, with the cooperative groups and so on, uh, you know, some of these new algorithms become very, very uh, you know, efficient. So we're beginning to phase out some of the older material and begin to you know, put in some of the new things that uh, will be more useful for future GPUs. Um, one of the uh, requests which Benme has for all uh, is please share your feedback on the book. Uh, suggest what topics are missing uh, that can be included. So talk to him afterwards so that mm -hmm. uh, we know uh, how we can uh, improve the book. Um, you brought about very interesting uh, uh, response uh, uh, on the out of order uh, and how things evolved. Uh, if I think about now the current generation of uh, LLM, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, we can create uh, mm -hmm. out of order uh, execution kind of uh, models uh, using agents, uh, co-pilots, mm -hmm. and also there is an uh, interesting thought about can I create a LLM OS uh, kind of a thing. What do you think uh, from the GPU side and also from uh, the uh, AI side? What things to request to evolve uh, uh, to enable something of this sort? Do you think uh, we will be there in some time? Or uh, I, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, my honest answer is I don't know. <laughs> um, so the couple things that I think will be important. Um, you know, the, uh, I, when I was talking to some of the teams here, you know, we we. we you know, we, we already know some of the uh, deficiencies. For example, uh, the CPU side of things, you know, the driver and so on. Uh, the CUDA driver is very, very old now. So, the, you know, it doesn't even have enough of the, um, you know, dependency, uh, you know, capabilities and uh, asynchronous capabilities. So, so many things are done synchronously. 
And um, you know, it's time for a major revamp. So when we start to talk about um, you know, LLVM operating system and so on, if we don't have that foundation in the driver, these things are not going to end well. You, when you build something on top of a little gelatin, you know, it, it's going to just fall apart, right? Mm -hmm. So the, and another important part is that um, you know, it, when, we, when we think about um, communication and when we think about you know, the, how to coordinate these uh, multi-GPUs and so on, um, our memory consistency model, our synchronization primitives, you know, some of these things really need to be rethought. And um, you know, in the old days, all these things belong in the kernel mode, uh, not the GPU kernel, the operating system kernel mode, privileged and protected. But in the future, these things need to become democratized. You know, these things no, need to go into the user mode. But we all know that uh, when it comes to the user mode, there are a whole slew of new problems that we need to make sure that we understand so that we can build real products out of it. This is interesting. So um, every time, uh, this is a common thing that we have constantly observed. Uh, after writing many CUDA programs, uh, one thing that we always ask is that when CUDA program does not work really well, uh, the first question I often ask is like, okay, have you seen your CPU program? Uh, is CPU doing the real job or not? Ambul's law, like Prado was saying in the morning, Ambul's law always kicks in. Um, interesting. Um, the thing is, uh, we are also uh, seeing a, uh, you are actually hitting your fourth decade, uh, so of your doing research. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so he has pivoted every decade. So uh, what are you pivoting to? Uh, so that we know the kinds of problems that we have to think about from the community side. Uh, that we have to be excited about, that we have to uh, work together to solve problems. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the next decade of problems that we have to uh, work on? Again, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so the, I think you know, the, if anything coming to this kind of event you know, the, uh, really, really teach me a lot of things that um, I, honestly I, I feel old. In this gen, in this audience, okay, but, you know, everyone here is young and energetic. So one of the things that I learned is that um, you know, when when I supervise grad students, the first thing I do is to make sure that I don't get in the way, right? And so, you know, whatever you do, you know, the be bold and be you know the, and be fearless. Um, you're going to be making mistakes. Okay. Having said all that, uh, I do have some personal, uh, you know, the personal view about this. And then, you know, in 10 years, hopefully, we can come and talk about whether these views are right or wrong. Um, I feel that uh, uh, we're fundamentally doing something that is a little bit, I would say, questionable. Uh, we're trying to train all the data into these models. And when the data gets bigger and bigger, these models need to get bigger and bigger. And we're trying to you know, regurgitate information or whatever you want to say, generate, uh, regenerate information as quickly as possible out of the huge training data that we train into the model, right? So that's why we have all these, you know, the uh, good, you know, techniques like speculative, you know, the, you know, the, the, the inference and so on. But I think we need to stay, take a step back at this point and think about this. What is the, what if we can real time, for any kind of query, we can real time gather all the information necessary to answer that question in milliseconds, okay? So, you know, let's think about it this way, right? You, you can use the model to try to, you know, to, to regenerate the information you use to train the, the model. And we used to think that this data is so expensive to, you know, to access and so slow from the object stores and all, all that stuff, right? But if in the next few years you start to see systems where you can get a gigabyte's worth of information out for any particular query out of 10 petabytes of data or 10 petabytes of things that Google and so on currently only serve from the web search, right? And the information can be presented in a way that can be fed into some kind of model that is trained to be able to take that information and synthesize, summarize the right thing, 
right, to answer the question, rather than trying to get everything from that model. And I believe we will be taking a different course in the future. And the data, no matter what, how good we are, we always need to go back to the facts. We also always need to be able to debug some of these things. And having data access capability, I believe, will be the next step for these models. And we already see REG now, right? But REG is just a start. And real-time access to a, the bunch of things that we currently only can regenerate from the models I believe will change the course of this whole revolution. So in 10 years, we'll see. Data access is a key problem uh, that we have to solve. Uh, uh, earlier today and also yesterday, Stephen Jones was also speaking, IO is a big problem that we have to address. Uh, and the more we increase our compute resources, IO is going to be the bottleneck that we have to consider thinking about. Um, there is a lot of uh, interest and also challenge that comes in. Um, uh, when it comes to education. You have been an educator for several years. Uh, with the introduction of uh, chat GPT, language models, now many questions can be easily answered by the uh, uh, model itself. So what is the role uh, that you think uh, from education standpoint of view? What is the, how, how should the education should transform uh, in, the, uh, in the new uh, language model era? Okay, um, let me say it this way. I'm not an educator. Um, I see myself as a teacher. There's a difference between teaching and, edu uh, and a teacher and educator. Um, educators need to think about the whole thing. Um, you know, when someone asks me, after 33 years teaching at the university, you know, what the, do you miss teaching? You know, after you move to Nvidia, right? I said, um, yes or no. I miss teaching in the sense that when I explain something and I see my students start to, to light up, and that's what I miss. What I don't miss is to try to come up with the final exam questions and then grade the final <laughs> exam and then catch the cheaters and then, uh, and then figure out what to do with the cheaters. I, every semester I have plenty of supply of those, right? So here's the thing, right? The, the cheating is always gonna be there, right? And with these tools, cheating will be easier, right? So, so you know, the, I, I, I don't know how to solve that problem. And on the other hand, I believe that if we teach students in a way that they, get true, they become truly interested in the subject, a very good big portion of the students will never cheat, okay? And that's what I believe, but can we, get to that point. And maybe we should begin to have some of the boring parts of the education taken care of by the, by the models, right? And, you know, and then have the, the real teaching part to, to deal with some of the real subtleties and the real difficult part of things so that uh, you know, maybe we never have to, to, you know, to deal with cheating again. So let's see. Very nice. Um, we have about uh, uh, almost time. Um, so, uh, uh, Professor Hu, uh, thank you so much for sharing your insight and experiences Thanks with us. Thanks for having me. Um, your work had an incredible uh, impact on everybody's life here. Um, everybody uh, have some or some other way have read your book uh, uh, or extract of your book so that they made uh, far progress in writing crude kernels today or uh, in several uh, weeks before. Uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, this same work is going to continue to impact everybody of our life for many, many more years. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, everything. So thank you. This is a token of appreciation from Kuda Mode. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.